Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the most important conversation here in Davos. Um, leading through crisis, what works and what doesn't. I'm Sara Pantulian, I'm the Chief Executive at ODI, and I want to welcome, first of all, everyone who is gathered around this table in Davos, but also our online audience, that I know is very numerous today, that is, tr is joining us through the ODI website. We are really, really grateful to MasterCard um, for hosting us in the hub culture, in the tech lodge here, um, fantastic space for these important conversations. But I'm really grateful to all of you around the table, you know, leaders and executives that have taken time out of crazy schedules here in Davos to join these conversations. We reached to each of you because you have some really unique perspectives to this challenge. And I think this is a challenge that couldn't be more timely or important. I mean, we've, we've seen over this past decade a number of really interconnected, quite unique um, you know, challenges, crises, they've become the new normal <coughs> very much. And citizens are looking to their leaders um, to make sense of this crisis, but they're struggling to get the leadership that they're hoping for. And so there is a growing sense that we need fresh approaches you know, to navigate through, uh, particularly against the backdrop of technological advancement. If you walk on the promenade, everything is like generative AI, right? So this strong leadership is needed now more than ever to tackle inequality, to tackle injustice, if you don't want them to get entrenched. So last year at ODI, we launched Tandem. Tandem is our executive leadership development program because we want to try and help the leaders of the humanitarian and development sectors in particular um, to become the better leader of tomorrow. It's a program supported by USAID, and, and really we seek to you know, make it become the premier training ground for tomorrow's leaders. We know that the most pressing challenges that we're facing today globally, from the climate emergency to the breakdown in peace and security, uh, polarization, racial injustice, we can't address them in isolation. We can't address them you know, in isolated sectors, which is why we have a, a cross-section of you know, industries represented around, around <coughs> this table. And through Tandem, we want to equip those who are on the front line of some of these naughtiest challenges you know, responding to humanitarian crisis, trying to help countries on their development trajectory, really have the skills, you know, to collaborate with others to bring about lasting change. So, the conversation today, what are the traits of an effective leader in this particular, you know, historical moment and for the uncertain future that we face? Um, you all have a wealth of experience across a range of industries and we're gonna use your insights to continue to refine the tandem program. I want to start by introducing some very special guest speakers that we have with us. Um, farthest to my left, Mark Marlow Brown, Lord Mark Marlow Brown, uh, president of the Open Society Foundations. Um, next to Mark is Tirana Hassan, the executive director of Human Rights Watch. To my uh, immediate left, Amy Pope, very first woman, director general of the International Organization for Migration. And to my right, I have Andrew Levy, the Chief Corporate of Government Affair Affairs Officer at Accenture. Thank you so much for joining us to help provoke the conversation. But before we get <coughs> stuck in the conversation, I'm gonna go to Jeremy Hillman, who is the MasterCard Senior Vice President of External Engagement, who is gonna kick us off with some opening remarks. We're really delighted to be partnering with you today for this event, Jeremy. Thank you, Sarah, and it's fantastic to host you and ODI and your, your, your great team here, a lot of great friends and partners around the table. Uh, so we've had some amazing conversations here in this MasterCard uh, Tech Lodge uh, this week around cybersecurity, around financial health, around uh, uh, sustainability. But I think in some ways this conversation today is almost the, the most important, the, the idea of, of showing leadership in these troubled times. And, uh, uh, and so I'm really excited to sort of host this uh, right now. Uh, I think we probably all agree we need more and better leadership. We've not stayed ahead of some really challenging issues. We've not stayed ahead of uh, misinformation. We have not stayed ahead of some climate and sustainability issues uh, before now, and we've not stayed ahead of some really challenging geopolitical tensions that have caused a lot of, uh, you know, misery and for lives and livelihoods. So, you know, how do we, you know, how do we do that? And where is the optimism to draw? And I think there is optimism, and I think we've seen a lot of it here this week in Davos. I remember being here a couple of years ago, and all along the promenade, it was crypto, crypto, crypto. Here, it's it's AI, 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 and 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 I think. It's, a, it's an effort that we are, 
that we see a new and transformative technology and there's a real willingness and, and, and uh, to get ahead of this technology and, and, and think about how we're building an inclusive digital ecosystem and, 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 and managing the risks and leveraging the opportunities of this new technology. So, uh, you know, I won't speak for long, but look, I think at MasterCard, uh, I think probably we, you know, we think that, that we've really, to, to, to show leadership, we really have to work on our core, you know, take from our core expertise. So, you know, we work in important areas like small business and uh, data for social impact and financial inclusion. We believe that showing leadership is really utilizing the core skills and capacities we have. We're really proud to be celebrating 10 years of the Center for Inclusive Growth this year. And, uh, uh, and so, you know, really happy to be hosting this conversation and I'll pass it back to you, but thank you, Sara. Thank you, thank you so much. MasterCard is really leading the way of bringing together different industries on the financial inclusion in particular. Let's get started to my feature speakers, as we're calling them. So, as I said, this is a particular moment of you know, geopolitical uncertainty. So what are the traits that leaders need to successfully steer organizations, companies, institutions? And, and, and tell us, what lessons have you learned in your leadership journey? Mark, can I start with you? Well, you know, I, I got to study at the feet of the master, which was Kofi Annan. Um, and, you know, there were two traits I learned, well, I, I'm not sure I learned, but I observed in him. One was an extraordinary capacity for empathetic listening, um, an immediate understanding of where two highly opposed people or countries, uh, there might be some overlap of interests to press on. But it came from listening, listening, listening. And beyond it, a great willingness to uh, begin any conversation with how are your family, how are you, uh, before turning to the business of the day. So there was a humanity uh, which I think often gets lost. Uh, the, the second, I think, issue was to constantly, and I often use this phrase that I learned from him, which um, you know, he claimed was an African aphorism. I sometimes wonder whether it really was or whether he just invented it and made it up. But he always used to say, you, you can't change the wind, but you can bend the sail. Uh, and, you know, it's all about, you know, recognizing the realities you faced, but finding a way to navigate through them rather than exhausting yourself trying to bang up against the wind or a brick wall time after time. But as you navigate to remember that if you are a UN leader, not most notably Secretary General, but anyone, or in a human rights space or anything, you know, navigation mustn't mean betrayal of fundamental principles. So take that, and I will just very quickly, to, to today. And, you know, I think even he would be daunted by the di many dimensions of the crisis today. And it makes me add one other fact to it, which is, you know, the need both to understand the sort of interconnectedness and multi-sectoral nature of what is happening, to recognize that apparently disparate events from a war in the Middle East to one in Ukraine to the hottest year on record, to, you know, that all that there are interlinkages between these, there are roots about within the breakdown of the current system of governance and economics in the world. And to recognize that and to try and ride it in ways which allow new approaches uh, to emerge. But in doing so, to be very disciplined because it's so easy uh, to dissipate our energies over firefighting in a hundred different directions and to instead set your navigation point towards something you in your sector can achieve which will contribute to the resolution of that much bigger crisis of which we can only feel the immediate part we touch in our work seems to me critical. Just And finally, just thank you for having set up this initiative. I think it's great to have an executive training of this kind. And bravo to you and USAID <coughs> staff. 
Thanks, Mark. And it's fantastic to be able to learn you know, from all of you who have tried and have so much experience. And I can see that you know, this, uh, these incredible words of, uh, of Kofi Annan will be used you know, throughout the training and beyond. Uh, I will take them you know, to help steer my own organization <laughs> for a start. And Diana, Mark talked about the challenge in particular for those who lead you know, rights organizations and having to obviously um, make sure that we stay sort of truthful to your principles. What are your takeaway on leadership and uh, um, what you can sort of share from your journey? Um, it's, a, it's a big question, uh, actually. I mean, one of the things that um, I think is making particularly the rights movement at the moment and to lead a right, human rights organization such a challenge um, is that the assault on human rights um, is coming from multiple directions. So yes, we have big conflicts, which are obviously polarizing the world and dominating the narrative. Um, and those sort of larger, they are also, you know, the conflicts that we're seeing, um, you know, are polarizing conversations and community in business. Um, in everyone's organisation, in our communities, in our schools. And so that resonates throughout all organisations. But at a whole, like the fundamental idea of human rights is also being challenged and chipped away at. So right now, I mean, the thing that we have to hold on to is being able to articulate our principles and, at the same, and being able to push back. And that is actually, and being able to find that, Mark alluded to it, what is your North Star? And I think being able to articulate and define your North Star, both as an organization so that you know what it is that we're rallying around. It is so easy in a fragmented world for everyone to know, you know, what is our, what is our business or what is our organization do. But you can, you risk in a polarized world having your workforce of whether it's 50 people or 650 people or 1,050 people turning up everybody with a different idea of why they come to work and what our organization should do. And one of the things about articulating our principles um, and being able to articulate your North Star is you don't say it once, you say it every day. Um, and we need to make sure that in every decision and every conversation that we're having, we start those conversations is how is that leading us towards our purpose? Um, and so, you know, I think that if we can ground ourselves in our principle and our purpose, that's the first thing, and we need to constantly remind it, us of it. If I can talk on an issue of culture for a minute, because we cannot deliver on our mission unless we have a healthy internal cultures. And in such a polarised world, one of the things I think that we, um, that we need to invest in now more than ever um, is making sure that we can have difficult conversations with respect. That we know what the that we know that when we disagree, um, that there can be disagreement, but we also know that those disagreements don't just linger and hang. You know, at a point where people feel powerless, um, they're the people we work for, they're the people we work with. I think it's really important that we need to create space for the conversations that happen, for people to be able to voice their concerns. But then you, we have to take decisions. We have to be able to take decisions um, and articulate our rationales why. And as leaders, being able to articulate that rationale and our why, even if people disagree, you know, I see, you know, smart, um, intelligent colleagues and partners who, you know, they understand the why and people move on and they make better decisions. Um, and I want to say one thing is that I've seen leadership emerge across the sector and across my own organisation from all sorts of levels. And I think in the moment of challenge and crisis, that's another thing we need to do, is not all leadership responsibility sits with those of us with, um, you know, um, wearing the big hat. Um, we need to continue to nurture the leadership that is throughout our organisations. Um, and lastly, um, I want to talk about one thing that's happening to the human rights movement. And I talked about this, this regression. And that is a challenge. How do we lead when you feel you're always on the back foot, when you feel you're on the defensive? Um, and I think that is really a, a principle of being bold. 
if you want to hold the line um, when it comes to, you know, protecting our principles, protecting human rights, praise, uh, protecting open and free societies, we need to be talking about being bold and being principled and not being scared. We are currently in an environment, and this will be my last point, where there is a real um, danger that we can be silent so that we're not wrong. And I think that that might be the most dangerous thing that will compound the crises that we're in. And um, that happens at all levels. That's happening when we see governments sort of chipping away at civil society space. And actually, I was just having a conversation about this, and then we find our partners, our organisations, being scared, saying, if I stick my head about, would the government come after me? That happens in... Um, discussions internally. Um, well, if I say something, you know, will I, will something happen to me? That's happening, we're seeing these examples everywhere. And I think you can be principled, speak out about it, but I wanna raise one other thing, which I read in an article recently, it's really stuck with me. Um, and it's pushing back against know your place aggression. <laughs> there is this concept where people who are speaking out in principled ways, people who are talking about the unpopular issues, um, people who are pushing back against repression um, are told, well, that's not your place. And if people and if other leaders and other organisations and if community or is not prepared to stand up and say that's not acceptable when somebody's stand bold enough to stick their head above the pulpit, then I think we're, um, I think that that's the backsliding and we have an opportunity to push back. Thank you very much, uh, Tirana, for the sobering reminder. Amy, there's so much wisdom already shared by Mark and, and Tirana, what resonates for you? you? You knew the helm of IOM, but you have a long leadership journey to share with us as well. So um, one of the best pieces of advice I got um, in a former job was you don't step off the curb until you know where you're going. Uh, which I actually find quite useful, and particularly in an organization where we deal with a lot of humanitarian crisis, uh, which means it's effectively a variation on this theme of what's your North Star, um, but it's a little bit more specific than that. It is what, are the, what is the world that we are hoping to create, and what are the key pieces of it? What does it look like concretely? And then even as we are responding in the midst of humanitarian <coughs> crisis, all the actions that we are taking are grounded in the outcome that we are trying to see. So in the migration space, I think that's absolutely critical because at this moment in time, if you were to read the headlines in any country, by the way, not just in the global north, but, but all over the world, you would believe that migration is this terribly destructive force that must be stopped when overwhelmingly the evidence shows us that migration is this incredibly powerful force for development and for good. And ultimately, our job at the International Organization for Migration is to figure out how we enable the unlocking of the tremendous human potential that comes when people move. It's complicated by the fact that we do this in the context of humanitarian disaster, and we know that when people are moving quickly, when people are moving without plans or strategy, that there are challenges that communities face, whether it's the host community, whether it's the government or the migrants themselves. So it, it's not to be so, you know, wear the rose-colored glasses and think, oh, what's happening in Sudan is actually a good thing. I mean, what's happening in Sudan is, is, a, is a very complicating, challenging thing, particularly for the people on the move. But if you just stop for a moment, and realize I was in Chad last week. A number of Chadians, half of the, the people who've migrated from Chad went to Sudan in search of better economic opportunities and better education. So if you stop for a moment and you think those people who are now coming back from Sudan into Chad very <coughs> likely have additional economic skills um, and languages and education and other experiences, so how do we move from just responding to their immediate humanitarian need and giving them a blanket to how do we mobilize and empower these people who are coming back across so they can actually be part of the development of Chad? Right, so that's the way I want to reframe this. Where do we want to go? 
And then whether it's in humanitarian response, whether it's in the planning and understanding displacement factors, or whether it's then very proactively identifying pathways for migration then that unlock human potential and human development. Keeping that in mind, despite the, there's a phrase one of my good friends uses, despite the ankle biting that's happening, despite the negative headlines, despite the um, emergency that we're facing, and so that then when we're reacting, what we're doing is ultimately another brick in the road toward the outcome. Thank you so much. I'll come back to you on some questions on, on migration and leadership. Uh, but Andrew, Accenture is a really, really important partner in tandem, and for a reason, because we felt that to help the humanitarian leaders, the development leaders, we also want to learn from the private sector. And so we, you know, we really want to, to hear some of the specific traits that the private sector thinks are important for leaders and how we can use them for our, um, our humanitarian development leaders. Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. The comments already have been amazing. And I think it's great to have some corporate uh, representation here, because as we'll talk about, there's a role that we can play individually, and I think particularly powerfully collectively. Um, but what's interesting is the remarks reflect, you hit about every point that I would have said if I was to go first. So Accenture actually and WEF did some work together on what are the traits of responsible, uh, modern, modern responsible leaders. I mean, just to paraphrase, a mission, which we heard, uh, an inclusive mindset, because the number of stakeholders that have to be uh, addressed and learned from is greater than, than ever, from employees to, to, if you're a public company, shareholders to, um, to others. Learning, listening and learning. I think we live in an era where things are changing so fast with technology and otherwise that having a learning mindset is essential. Um, not just for leaders, by the way, but at Accenture anyway, we, that's throughout the company is something we try to uh, inculcate. Empathy um, and um, say responsible, uh, responsible innovation, right? Um, so th I think we heard that all in different ways from, from the group. I'll also say, and, and Tarana and I were talking a bit about this before, the point about being able to have difficult conversations, very important, I would say, especially with recent events. We've, that's been something that we've been um, struggling with. I mean, we have a very truly, truly human culture, as we say, in, and we work very hard to, to, to um, cultivate that at our company, which I should have said at the beginning, Accenture is about almost 800,000 people globally, so we're kind of a small country with, within ourselves, with very diverse views, diverse everything, um, which it makes it a wonderful place, but we experience internally everything that would play out around the world, basically, in a microcosm. And so that's been ch challenging uh, at different periods, and I think right now in particular, so that's something we're trying to, f we haven't quite solved exactly how you do that, but encouraging uh, open dialogue with respect is really important. So everything I've heard so far is I think really encompasses what it, what it means. Thanks. Uh, fantastic to see that there is some validation <laughs> also in the corporate sector. I just have a quick follow-up question for, for each of you. Uh, uh, Mark, uh, this is you know, defined as the age of, of polycrisis. You lead a very important philanthropy in, uh, um, in this context. What are some of the most difficult trade-offs you've had to make? Well, <coughs> I mean, I think an obvious one, given the sort of human rights dimension of, of some of this conversation, is the sort of the challenge to traditional human rights, Tirana and I have discussed this a lot, and we find Human Rights Watch and OSF are pursuing a very similar strategic journey. In fact, I even read Tirana's uh, objectives to my board and pretended they were mine until, <laughs> until they'd all affirmed how brilliant it was. And then I said, actually, I've stolen them from HRW. But to make a point, which was, you know, just how the old model of naming and shaming on human rights and the focus on political and civil versus economic and social just didn't do justice to the nature of this crisis with, you know, where the old sort of north-south hierarchies of power are gone uh, and where, you know, people are looking at so many issues through the lens of theirs and their families, economic security and well-being, rather than through the abstracts of something like human rights, uh, you know, as an abstract principle to determine your support or not for your government, etc. So to sort of move how we operate to understand that the model has totally changed uh, and that we've got to find lobby new 
new kinds of constituencies that we'd ignored in the past around new kinds of issues. You know, it's been really difficult because, you know, both Human Rights Watch and OSF, you know, were enormous successes of that old model. You know, I mean, we rode to power or influence on the back of the fall of the Berlin Wall, or end of apartheid in South Africa, and a simple world where we could say, if we can strengthen civil society and get governments to, to just pass simple you know, human rights legislation, then civil society will hold governments to account via the ballot box. You know, and that model simply doesn't work for all sorts of reasons too complicated to go into now. But in that, you know, in that context, forcing not just oneself, but all of one's colleagues to totally rethink how we deliver our mission, you know, is, is challenging, but necessary. Absolutely. Um, Tirana, you've just published the, the World Report 2024. And one thing that struck me is that you really highlighted the double standards, you know, the selective outrage, I think you call it, that we've seen from our leaders in recent times. I mean, of course, the Gaza crisis is on the minds of everyone. What do we need to demand a better response from our leaders? Um, so, you know, what the, the double standards is the most obvious part because that is when governments are actually public. You know, so that's when you actually can see it. Um, I think that where we need to stop and what enables the double standards to, to perpetuate is something that we refer to as uh, transactional diplomacy. And I think that transactional diplomacy is unfortunately one of the trends that we have seen picking up globally. There's not a single region in the world. And what transactional diplomacy actually means is that governments are choosing to ignore human rights that are happening when they are happening with a potential partner um, that they need to, uh, to advance their own sort of domestic agenda. And I mean, actually, migration is a key example of that. You know, here we are, we find ourselves and we see multiple examples, um, and let's just take the EU for one. The EU migration deals, instead of addressing the, the you know, backsliding of human rights that we have seen in Tunisia, the outright repression that we see in Egypt, the significant, the litany of human rights abuses, including, you know, torture and mistreatment of migrants and refugees, um, in places like Libya. Instead of the European Union of, you know, addressing the human rights concerns there, they, they turn a blind eye so that they can actually develop you know, partnerships and contracts to ensure that these countries will hold migrants uh, and asylum seekers back so that they don't enter the European bloc. And that is simply just an enabling environment for rights abusing governments. So when you think about you know, what can you do differently, it's very easy. Principled approaches, these are international standards. When it comes to human rights, these aren't nice to haves. These are international obligations. And so we need to be holding all governments to the same standards. Because if you don't, it simply emboldens rights. When we see backsliding, if we ignore that, what comes after that is attacks on institutions, the institutions that we rely on, the courts and independent media, for example. Um, you know, they attack the institutions we rely on to create open and free societies. So creating, um, so ensuring that we're holding all governments to the same standards, we're not creating carve-outs, um, that governments are not allowing carve-outs and free passes just to allow advancement of their own agendas. And also I think that there's a role to play from everyone, and that is you have to make the cost of human rights abuses higher. You can do that through, you know, um, through uh, speaking out. Uh, I think that corporates have a role to play here, um, you know, ensuring that there is human rights at the centre um, of your operations. And of course, I think, you know, making sure that um, the consistent application of rights and that there is accountability when there are rights um, abuses um, is going to be key. Thanks. You mentioned migration, and you know, particularly in, in terms of the countries of origin. But you said something else about the human potential that is unlocked with migration. Uh, 
that is really difficult to get leaders to accept. How are we going to help them reframe the debate around migration? Um, so first of all, it's probably not us who will do it, right? I mean, um, as good as we all are, and we are, right? Um, we are not the ones who are going to change their minds. And it's why, for example, I'm here for this, this week, because I see the power of changing the narrative actually in groups like the private sector. Because it's the private sector who benefits when migration works well. It's the private sec sector that creates the jobs. It's the private sector that needs a sustainable workforce and the private sector that needs continued innovation, right? And so I think, I'm, I'm betting that the private sector is going to be the more effective advocate for migration as a tool for development than any of us who say, yeah, governments, you really should do a better job because that's, that's the, the right thing to do, right? I'm appealing to economic self-interest, so, so we start there. Um, the second is, is the communications about this. Um, we, as the International Organization for Migration, I believe have a responsibility to communicate how and why and where migration can work. I think in the past, we've fallen into the trap of communicating only about the disasters communicating only about people who died in boats crossing the Mediterranean or the Channel or showing up on the border. And this is not to take away from the value of the lives that were lost, and it is not to normalize the death um, or harm that is happening to people on the move, but it's to move away from that narrative that migration is only about death and destruction and loss and really look for the examples of where it's actually driving tremendous human outcomes in, in capitals and countries and small towns all around the world, right? Um, and not just in, again, not just in Europe, but also in Europe, right? Um, I think the other thing is really embracing technology. I mean, this is the Davos of AI. By the way, I think it's also the Davos of the poly crisis, because I keep hearing this word being <laughs> repeated over and over again. But, um, <laughs> And then someone said we need polyamory to respond to the poly crisis. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> so, right, right, exactly, exactly. But I think um, we need to be embracing AI, for example, as a tool to help us solve and address the problem. So again, sticking with migration, the way we work is when we, um, the way I think this will work is when we can connect people who are looking for opportunities and the skills that they have with the opportunities that exist. Now that's really hard to do if we're just relying on researchers and econo uh, uh, economists and um, you know sort of old ways of working. with them, of course. Yeah, <laughs> all of that is necessary. But I think the game changer will be when we use AI to help us do this faster and help us do it in real time, so we can help create um, more real time real time opportunities. And then finally, last thing, it's all about the, it's the partnerships, um, right? You know, we can be the best IOM in the world. I think we're pretty good at what we do, but um, it's not gonna be us alone. It's gonna be engaging with all of you. It will be engaging with governments, engaging with mayors, engaging community leaders, and of course, the migrants themselves. Absolutely, and it's interesting, when we were um, advertising the event online, um, um, a colleague you know, sort of commented, well, if it is the age of the poly crisis, it didn't say you know, polyamory, but he said, you know, what, we, what we need is collective leadership, so how we you know, sort of really engineer these partnerships that can bring collective leadership. Um, so Amy talks about you know, the importance of the corporates. We've seen this year, this, this week, we've seen the Edelman Trust Barometer, we'll hear you know, more about it in a second. It found that businesses are the only institution that is seen as competent and ethical. Big responsibility. So how can businesses use this position to drive collective action? Great question, and a lot to unpack and respond to actually in the last comments. I guess to put in context a little bit that idea of like the reduction in credibility of governments in particular, I was reading an article that talked about, that tried to explain uh, the geopolitical tensions that we're having, and they cited sort of the structural issues, and I think they're relevant, because one was that the, the governments or the institutions, so, some of them that we would t traditionally have relied on, no longer reflect the balance of power in the world, the global south rising, China, et cetera, right? And the issues they're being asked to address climate, technology, are ones that they don't have any basis of, of to build on. So they're kind of building from scratch. And together, there's a lot of tension there. So I think that, that it gets to the point of needing a more inclusive approach to all this, all these issues. But, um, you know, leaders of businesses have a lot, <laughs> it's, it, it is a challenge, right? Because you have to do a lot of things at once. You have to run a business, just obviously. You have to look for growth in an environment where it's not 
you know, where there, there, there are challenges to that. And then you have to try to address these social and economic issues. I think the point um, that Amy was sort of getting at is if you can if, uh, align your mission with some of these efforts, because it has to work all around, especially for public companies. You have sh shareholder obligations and all that stuff. But there are issues, and I'll give a couple examples, that are very much in, in, uh, in line with those objectives, but are also for the, for the better good of, of the world and some of these issues. So um, let's see, I'll do mi migration first. So the, the, um, our CEO and, and the CEO from Google brought together a bunch of other CEOs in the US to form something called Welcome US, welcome.us, which is essentially to work with the US government to help with private resettlement of refugees. It started with Afghan and Ukrainians, now it's expanded. Um, and the power in that, that's why I said the collective power is quite amazing, because the, um, not just for visibility and, and, and accelerating uh, efforts, but what they can tangibly bring to the effort, right? A diverse group of companies, MasterCard's part of that as well, um, is quite remarkable. And so that's been a good example of, it was, it was CEO leadership, support from the government, but it was, a, it was a private sector idea to bring this together and work with government uh, to, to provide things that government frankly can't or can't do fast enough. So that was one, I think, really positive example. And then to bring it to AI, um, I think it's super relevant. We are doing uh, a lot with our, uh, our clients, and our clients are all sort of big companies, right? So it's an interesting perspective. But we do a lot around AI, and, and we're doing, and I personally am doing a lot with AI governance and how to take it forward on a global basis. And, and we, we uh, actually, I think yesterday, WEF announced a report that we helped uh, contribute to on uh, global governance for AI. And, and one of the themes is the need to have it be an inclusive uh, group. There's a real risk, and that's why I think WEF has a uh, good position here, that, that things get decided sort of at the G7 or even the G20, right? And of course, there's stuff to learn from all those institutions, but, you know, and the UN is in the game as well, which is terrific, but they don't get the same private sector input, right? So you need this government, civil society, academia, and corporate in a diverse uh, way to really have this be a sustainable, whatever we just, where we land on this stuff for it to be sustainable and not exacerbate problems. So those are just two examples where I think uh, companies driving and insisting on uh, certain frameworks can be really helpful. But thank you so much for the, a brilliant sort of um, set of, you know, provoking um, inputs for the conversation. We've got just under half an hour and a lot of you know, fantastic people I want to hear from. I've got a couple of colleagues I want to bring in right away to sort of react to uh, some of what they've heard, uh, but each of you has a lot to contribute, so please you know, sort of raise your hand and come in. Uh, Raj, let me start with you. We have um, Raj Kumar is the president and edit editor-in-chief of DevEx. You've been reporting on crises and you know, sort of difficult countries for a very long time. What positive example of leadership have really stood up to you? It's nice to get to talk about positive stories. <laughs> we don't get to do that much. And by the way, they just shut this off, but I had the advantage of sitting in a place where I could see over each panelist's shoulder their professional photograph. <laughs> and, and after three days of no sleep, I have to say you all sound compelling, you're <laughs> eloquent, and you look good. <laughs> so if, if that could be part of the leadership course, I will be your first student. Uh, I don't know what, what, what you're doing, uh, the four of you. I can, bar <laughs> I can barely remember my name at this point of Davos, but I guess two, two stories come out to me. One is the Black Sea Grain deal, and I think that's an example of behind-the-scenes leadership. And we wrote you know, kind of an insider take on how that actually went down, and there's no one person, but it was people like Rebecca Greenspan and David Beasley and Antonio Guterres himself. I think he deserves you know, real credit for this, as well as you know, a small Swiss NGO and people inside the the architecture of the UN, really working behind the scenes. They were not out front. Uh, but if you think about 30% of the world's wheat comes from Russia and Ukraine, and you want to think about a good news story, what was averted by having that deal happen was significant. So I think we should not lose sight of that. And I think the second, the second good news story about leadership um, is one that's much more public, and that's around the multilateral development bank reform, which is still a story that's you know underway, but just think back where we were, what, a year and a half ago, right? People like Jamie were out there banging the drum, trying to create change. Al Gore was a leader on this, being very public and vocal. Uh, there were journalists involved, like David Gellis, interviewing David Malpass, and you know, he kind of put his foot in his mouth. So there were a lot of people behind this, but then think of all the people in the, in the architecture of the US Treasury and the other stakeholders and, and shareholder governments, and even inside the World Bank. I mean, Jeremy knows very well what it means to move that ship 
and here we are, not long since it looked like this was an institution that wouldn't change. There's a, there's a roadmap, there's a new president who comes from the private sector, there's a ton of momentum and other MDBs are signed up to it, so it's not a story that's over, but it's one we've reported on a lot and you have to, to be fair, say there's real progress there and it's a real example of leadership. So those are two that come to mind for me. Brilliant, and we have a session this afternoon in the Congress Center, a private one on uh, the reform of the MDBs. I'm hoping that we can continue <laughs> to push to see real change there. Um, Sumaila, Sumaila Zubero is the president and CEO of the Africa Finance Corporation. And I think AFC st stands out because you really try and have a collaborative you know, approach across sectors and industries. So can you share some of the success stories that you see from the AFC point of view? Thank you very much, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this wonderful group. I've learned so many things. Um, my, I think my leadership vocabulary is going to improve based on the various quotes that I've heard. And I think that there's some important lessons that we can all build on. I, I just want to you know, focus us on something that I've heard that I think is important to build on, which is to lead, we need to focus on outcomes. We need to be looking at what are the results that we want to achieve. And you know, um, how would we get there? Essentially, how will we pay for those results? You know, that is so important, especially when we're looking at all the crises that we have around climate, you know, around net zero, with all the data that tells us that we're off track, and the fact that we just still have just this one planet you know, and there are not many other alternatives. Um, so it is really being open-minded around how can we generate the growth that allows us to pay for net zero. We can't expect net zero to happen by itself. You know, we need to understand that we must have the growth that will pay for it. We must have the investments in the technology, we must have the investments in the development of all the minerals and metals that are required to deliver the energy transition. We must be looking at credible um, renewable energy sources to <coughs> process all of that. And we should be open around where can all of this happen? You know, we can't expect energy transition to happen you know, by looking at investment just in the global north. We have to look at global south. We have to look at Africa in particular, which is vast mineral resources and its abundant renewable energy sources, as the region that provides the least carbon intensive energy transition. So the question we should be asking is, what are the mind blockers that we have? Why are we still looking at Africa as aid or charity? when this is clearly an investment position, a proposition that can generate the growth that the world needs. We all need growth. We can't pay for energy transition by itself. We also need to upscale our ambition of poverty. So as we're talking about multilateral development bank reform, I mean, I was in a meeting, I was in a room with the Deputy National Security Advisor, and I was saying to him, that, look, we need to be clear about what the ambition of the World Bank should be. Clearly, reducing poverty is not enough, you know, um, because you can easily go back to poverty. You know, we've seen a lot of progress with globalization. A lot of people have come out of poverty, but it's not enough. You know, people need to be empowered. So what is the threshold for empowerment? How can we get the world to work towards empowerment? The growth that comes from that is what is going to pay for the energy transition. So my simple message is what has worked is being outcomes-based. Focus on the results that we want to achieve. Let's focus on how we're going to pay for that and work towards achieving that. To your word about private sector being in the lead for that, yes, I agree, but it must be a partnership with government because government has to, government is the one only capable of doing certain things. And in a partnership with government, like we are a partnership between African governments and African uh, uh, investors, and we've been able to generate some results. So I think it's doing that at scale across different um, issues and topics that would deliver the results that we need. Thank you so much, Smile. I have a number of you that don't want to come in. I want to just ask Justin Blake from Edelman. We mentioned the 
trust barometer. Tell us a little bit more about these leadership traits that make the corporate sector so important for the public. Certainly. Um, Edelman has been studying trust in institutions for 24 years. We look at 28 countries. As you mentioned, business is the most trusted institution, more than government, more than media, and surprisingly more than NGOs. NGOs were the most trusted for about the first 20 years that we've done the survey. For the last four, it's been business. Part of the reason why, as you mentioned, is because business is seen as the most competent. Here's a stat that uh, really fascinates me and goes to this point of partnership. When it comes to innovation, people want to see that business is partnering with government. Okay, that's, of course most people would agree with a statement like that. Here's the fascinating thing. We asked that question a decade ago, 15 point jump of people wanting to see business partnering uh, with government around innovation. Let's focus on leaders for a second. Establishment leaders are not trusted. Heads of governments, heads of business, heads of NGOs. It's a, it's a sad state in, ter for, in terms of established leaders. So who do people trust instead? A person like myself, someone that they can relate to. So as I put my communications hat on, a lot of the words that we've talked about today, empathy, listening, inclusion, you, know, you can actually take the volume off. You can mute it and actually see those qualities in a leader. One of my favorite um, leaders that I've gotten to observe is Paul Pullman. And just watching him in the way he works a room, he goes not to the other CEOs in the room, he goes to the civil society folks. He goes to the more person on the street who might be there. He's leaning in. He's on their same level. He asks a question, and then he's listening. If you just watch an empathetic leader, you know it, because most of their time, their lips aren't moving. That is really brilliant. Um, something for all of us to reflect upon and definitely to integrate in uh, um, in our tandem in our curriculum as we help you know, the leaders that are still growing in their journey. Um, Sheila Warren is the CEO of the Crypto Council for Innovation. She's also a trustee of uh, ODI for our Washington office. Sheila, what are your leadership tips? You know, I think the, the one word that I haven't heard yet that I think is a theme that underlies a lot of what we've, what we've heard is uh, the concept of humility and the idea that there's always something to learn and whether that's to learn from your constituents, those you're trying to serve, whether it's from partners, whether it's from your opponents, frankly, or even your antagonists, I think, or in a world where that word is sadly very appropriate. Uh, I, I'm, I'm struck, I think, in this year, you know, we are seeing the most um, elections historically right, in the entire world. Uh, I was on a panel last week and, and I, I, I talked about, it was before the Taiwan elections, and I said, oh, we're starting with Taiwan and ending in November with the United States. And the sort of dark joke was, is the American election ever actually going to end? You know, so, which is a sad and very possibly true question. So I think we're in a time when we're expecting a lot of conflict around elections, adding to the other conflicts that already exist. And the fact that that is going to be a global phenomenon is quite troubling. And so I think it is extremely important to stay the course. I really loved the Kofi Annan, uh, or wherever it came from, concept of bending the sail, because more than ever, I think in this time of poly crisis, we're going to have to do that. So I think for me, my tips are remembering that in addition to the incredible things, and I echo that I'm going to be taking a lot of this back, is remembering that there's always more to learn and there's always a lot that we don't know and reminding ourselves that it is, it is, a, it is just a simple fact that the higher up you get in a position of authority or power, the more you do develop, whether you want to or not, what they called, you know, they call, Walter Isaacson called a reality distortion field. And surrounding yourself or, or making sure you step out of that as often as you can, reminding yourself that it exists. It's not your fault. It is inevitable. But awareness of that, I think, is, is quite crucial. Uh, and the best way out of that is to go to places where you, know, you may be the most novice, the most novitiate in the room. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. We have a few more colleagues who want to come in. We've got you know, more than 10 minutes, so enough time. Simon O'Connell, SMV. Thank you very much, Sarah, and sorry I'm late. Sorry I've lost my voice. Raj, glad my photo's not up there for uh, <laughs> sure. Um, 
I want to touch on that point around narrative that you made, Amy, and I wonder, um, I'm sorry, the, the colleague from Edelman, I didn't catch your name. Justin. Justin, um, nice to meet you. I, I wonder on business if it is indeed competency that is um, the reason behind those high levels of trust. I wonder if it's the fact that businesses on their narrative, they're kind of clear and open and honest around what, what they're about and what they're looking to achieve. They're looking to generate returns, right? They're looking to make money. And so I think, uh, when I think about leadership, um, uh, yes, humility, but I think the hugely important point is honesty around narrative. And I think the big issue that's happening in our world at the moment, there's lots of discussion here around disinformation and misinformation. There's also a massive issue around access to information. If you're from uh, Gao in North Mali or Boar in Western Central African Republic, you've got more access to these things, yes, not as inclusively as we would like, but definitely more access, and therefore more access to information. And through that, you've got greater ability to be aware of the dishonesty, dishonesty or the lack of sincerity around some of those narratives out there. So very briefly, um, as examples, something like uh, Global Gateway out of the EU, 300 billion euro investment, yeah? How much of that is really looking to generate impacts in those geographies, such as n n North Mali or Western Sea, or how much of it is it is it around preserving status quo and norms? And I would go further, perhaps even on the kind of development actor side, the Global North, Global South framing. I think that's, and I know it's been used a couple of times here already, so forgive me. Um, I think it's, it's too simplistic. I, I think it's being seen to be too simplistic. I think it's at risk of being seen to be not sincere or genuine enough. I think it's being used as a default to a preservation of existing structures and norms. So I think we need to recraft a different narrative, a more honest narrative, being aware that there's more access to information that at any time in, in human history. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Judith Arenas. Thank you so much, Judith Arenas with APCA Worldwide. So I just wanted to share a couple of data points because I think it's important for us to also reflect in terms of where does the leadership role fit in, particularly when you're talking about companies with the external environment. And I'm a member of the Forum's Global Future Council on the Future of Governance, where we've been looking at a lot at these issues. Um, in 2017, APCO did a survey of informed consumers, so these kind of people that really know issues. And in, at that time, the panorama was actually really positive because 90% of the people surveyed expected companies to engage on pressing social issues. 71% believed that it's acceptable, it was acceptable to take a stand. 93% believed that companies should do good for shareholders and society. And the conclusion was basically that if you remain silent, you would be seen as out of touch and distant. But fast forward to the end of 2022 when we redid this survey and actually looked at, again, these issues of corporate advocacy. And I am personally um, disappointed by the results. I understand where they fit in. But that percentage of 90% that believed in corporate action actually went down to 79%. We saw that there was an increase in... Uh, people believing that action should be internal and not external, and that the era of the vocal CEO was over because the, it was really about 56% of those surveyed believed that corporate CEOs had to take action, and this in 2022 fell down to 24%. That is a massive drop. And I think if we were to do, redo the survey now, it would actually be shocking. I'm also the senior advisor in a pro bono capacity to the UN Special Rapporteur on freedom of expression, Irene Khan. So thank you for bringing up the issue of disinformation because that's been a massive issue for us. And in that context, we've been looking very much at what is the role of companies in challenging these issues, especially when you look at tech governance and disinformation as the major issue that the forum identifies as a global risk. And we see that, um, frankly, companies are reluctant to engage. We had a, we had a session with uh, Airbnb um, leading on disinformation, a very unusual actor, but again, back to the, the future of corporate governance, CEOs are increasingly being asked, boards and the C-suite are being asked on pressing global issues such as the ones that you all shared. My background's from Amnesty International, so delighted to see you, Taran, and see you putting up all these issues. 
And bottom line, we're now seeing boards and the C-suite have to engage on human rights issues, but with the guiding principles being fantastic as a principle guiding line, but not enough. So I think a lot of scope for action, but not a lot of issues other than to say ethics and values have to be at the core, and that's what CEOs are expected to live through. Just, one, just 10 seconds, I know we have other stuff to cover. Um, the results are not shocking to me, and we could have, there are other sessions on what it means to communicate as CEOs and corporations. I would say, though, to me, it underscores the importance of the collective action. I think one antidote to, to the pressures that are reflected in that data is, is CEOs or companies working together to address issues so they're not uh, as exposed. Thank you so much. We've got five minutes and three colleagues to, between, uh, to bring in. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Georgia Cohan at the Source Economic Development Fund, which is the impact investing arm of Open Society, which means that um, I <coughs> have a human rights and civil society perspective and background, but also have spent a lot of time in investment in the private sector, so try, try to fuse the two. Just um, three brief observations, I think, from the discussion in the room. One is, one is a sort of obvious one that has to do with leadership combining, you know, real action and then communicating that action with sort of inspiring vision and leadership. And I think about the last several years under the Biden administration and the sort of post-COVID New <coughs> Deal, trillions of dollars out the door to infrastructure, IRA, not just post-COVID stimulus, and basically no credit for it because of the inability to communicate it. Um, but the, you know, the, the strong men on the other side who are very inspiring um, in a number of respects but don't have any action behind it. So I think this holds obviously both for civil society but also the private sector. Um, the second, uh, and Mark, if you'll forgive me, Mark Malgren is my boss and mentor and friend and colleague. Um, Mark and others often talk about sort of values versus interest framework um, and, and not just in di diplomacy but sort of in the way that all leaders are, are headed. And I would like to suggest that maybe it's a little bit of a false choice um, in, in the sense that if I think about public sector or civil society, I want to pick up on Amy's point. Um, which is thinking about, for example, migration not just as a challenge but as an economic opportunity um, and imperative and, and really appealing to folks' economic self-interest. And clearly in the public, in, sorry, in the private sector, um, as we think about this, I mean, part of the reason that companies have gotten such a boost in Edelman pre-COVID, they were you know, certainly sort of ahead of the, of the other sectors, but I think really stepping in during COVID and that was not altruism. I mean, the companies stepped in, you know, to help their employees to figure out sort of how to, how we work now in this virtual world, um, in assisting communities because that's what made them going concerns. Um, and I think, and it, sort of a related point, and I'm someone who works on sustainability and climate, um, is the real progress we made on sustainable investing, on climate, on ESG, and I would also argue on diversity came when corporates really understood that this was in their material interest, right? That this is really a bottom line issue and a fundamental stakeholder issue. The pushback against ESG and now DEI is I think when there's a perception that companies have overstepped and these are no longer material issues that they're tackling, but things that may be on the purview. And, the last quick point, the third point, is related on this values interest is about risk. And I would just say, you know, what we've finally seen on climate um, is, is that leaders in the public sector, civil society, the private sector have understood that the greatest risk on climate is inaction, right? That, that, that sort of dooms us all. And that, is, that holds on AI, right? I mean, that holds on democracy, you know, that, that holds on diversity. And so I think recalibrating risk um, is, is, this is a little bit, um, to Tirana's point, allows everyone to be bold in a way that combines you know, interests and values. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jojo. Sorry to hurry up. We're trying to finish oh, on time. Jamie, from sharing, Jamie Drummond from Sharing Strategies. I'll try to be very quick. Um, <coughs> can you hear me? Uh, uh, no, my, 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 please. Very briefly, I had a catch up the other day with Larry Kramer, who's just taken over at LSE, and uh, was obviously a very interesting leader at Stanford and at Hewlett. And told this story, you know, we were all a bit down. It was a drinks around Christmas, New Year. Everyone's a bit depressed. Um, uh, well, sorry, that's, that's, we were trying very hard to drink enough to be happy, but, you know, there was an air of uh, gloom. And uh, he, he told this story about how, when he started at Hewlett, projections at that time from IPCC reports were plus six to eight degrees by the end of the century. Um, I've been trying to actually verify what exactly the report said at that time. And that now they're what, plus two to three, depending on how well things are implemented. So pretty bad still, but a lot less than plus six to eight. And you know, so that's kind of a lot of progress from a lot of meetings, all the COPs, the Paris summit, all of the accretion of all of these moments over the last 10 years. Anyway, he's gonna write something up about 
that journey from his perspective at his time at Hewlett. And I thought that was quite an interesting example of multi-leveled leadership. And how are we going to go further? One of them is through uh, this MDB reform piece. And that's another one that's not just going to happen through lots of dull in insidery technical things, though those must happen and will and must be happening. And please push in your meeting on callable capital and a more fun and po easily communicated brand for IDA, two very important things. Um, but it's going to require the same kind of lots of leadership from lots of different places and some new forms of coordination and shared strategies between all of these different places and new ways of finding and identifying champions. And one of the applications of AI might be, how do all those diverse change makers speaking different languages and different idioms and so on around the world, but are kind of doing the same stuff, better find each other, just other than just you know, um, people like me kind of popping up or Raj popping up in places, connecting people, Mark popping up in places, connecting people, or, or sort of mining LinkedIn. You know, we, we've got to find a better way of finding the diverse change makers and maybe AI can help us in that one as well. That's a good, interesting thought. Asif, for you to conclude. Very quickly. Uh, Sorry, let me introduce her. Asif Saleh, CEO of Brack. Thank you. Um, so just picking up of uh, what Justin said about Popol, when one day, when once I was one of those civil society guys who came in and talked to me, and he said that you don't need a lot of people to change the world. You need 30 people who actually can take big decisions and influence to change their mind, and they can change the world, right? So investing on who you think those 30 people are, getting them in the same room, and, and their relationship, I think, is a critical element. And, and, that, and that needs to be multi-sectoral, whether it's in the government, in private sector, civil society. That I took to heart, and I've been doing that, and I'm getting huge dividends. And going back to your point, Jeremy, that that's essentially finding those people and kind of cultivating a re uh, relationship of trust that uh, even though certain decisions you don't like, but you know where it's coming from because everybody is suffering from insecurity leading to transactional di uh, diplomacy, to transactional decisions. And the second point is that for civil society organizations particularly, I think too often we, the leaders focus just for communicating to their donors or to their mission or the board but we forgot to communicate with the public, right? That, you know, why, what does human rights stand for? What does it mean? I mean, in a way, the people understand, right? So I think, in a sense, that is causing that redu reduction of trust on civil society organizations as well. So we need to be able to tell our stories better and communicate with the public in the way that uh, they understand. And, and social media has opened up that platform. So I think it's good storyteller, good communicator, absolutely necessary. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Sorry, Mary, do you want to come in for like 30 seconds? Mary Lor from the Africa Development Bank. Really 30 seconds. No, I think great conversation, and I think uh, uh, a lot to take back. I, I just wanted to add maybe one thing that we, we I haven't heard much about is a leader must be able to be disruptive every now and then. I think uh, if indeed, as we have heard, you have the end in mind, you know the outcome that you want to pursue, you are bold, you are principled, you stick to your values, you communicate, you need to be able to be disruptive. And I wanted to take just one little example since we are talking about MDBs, uh, more capital, etc. This is exactly what uh, uh, President Adeshina did with the initiative on rechanneling special drawing words, uh, drawing rights through uh, uh, MDBs. This is something that was not a given when he had this idea at the beginning. Collective leadership, partnership, partnering with the Inter-American Development Bank, doing the research, communicating, communicating, and communicating. And today, this is something that is, I think, uh, uh, accepted, and we hope to see it happen shortly. So be disruptive, partner with others, communicate, over-communicate, be resilient, stick to what you want, and you will get there. <laughs> Thank you so much. What an incredible conversation. Let me sum up. I've taken 10 points that I think we can probably have as the you know, decalogue for the future leaders. Uh, empathetic listening, uh, humility, 
for the clear North Star, repeat over and over, <laughs> you know, we've heard, but be disruptive, you know, e even though you have a North Star. Stay focused, um, don't dissipate too much energy, Mark said. Um, you need to have an inclusive mindset. Six, don't shy away from difficult conversations. Um, and that is both public and private, you know, take positions, but being principled, you know, through, through those. Um, seventh, create partnerships, relationships, share strategies, you know, all around how we, you know, a, a sort of engineer this collective leadership. Um, eighth, be relatable, lean in. Um, ninth, we heard a lot about helping shape the narratives, you know, beyond the noise of disinformation and misinformation. Um, sort of the, the ethics, the values that really need to enter the C-suite. Um, are important, so these are the narratives that we need to shape. And tenth, we've just heard it now with us, if clear communication, tell our story better, communicate, 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 Marie Lohr said. Um, let me thank our online audience as well. The recording will be made available pretty much immediately this afternoon via the ODI website and our YouTube channel. To find out more about Tandem, visit tandemleadership.org and follow updates um, from Tandem and ODI on uh, social media. I just want to close with what Mark opened with. I'm going to take that away and use it myself, the words of um, a, a dear friend and sort of in, in, inspire of many, Kofi Annan, you can't change the wind, but you can bend the sail. Well, let's go out and bend these sails so that we can help more people uh, be the leaders of tomorrow. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>